So now I have a great pleasure in introducing Richard, Richard Collins, who is taking our service this morning. Thank you very much, Richard. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you again. And I'm surprised to see so many of you because originally I understood you were going to have an away day or weekends. There we are, so it's all right, that's fine. So you've turned up anyway, in spite of me, right? <laughs> it's good to be here with you to worship God. And we continue that now. We'll sing our first hymn together, number 357, if you're following it in your books. Jesus, name <coughs> high over all, in hell, in earth, or sky, angels revere, and nations fall, and devils fear and fly. Yes, the words have changed from the old hymn books. <laughs> Let's pray. <coughs> we 
we praise you, great and gracious God, glorious and eternal ruler of time and space, making the universe and everything that's in it. And you created men and women in your own image and revealed your purpose and your love through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We praise you, loving Lord Jesus, coming to earth to reveal the Father's love. We praise you for your humble birth, your ministry and teaching, preaching and healing, for your death on the cross, for your glorious resurrection and ascension, and for your continual intercession for us and for the gift that you sent of the Holy Spirit. So we praise you, Holy Spirit, source of all goodness and truth. You are always with God's people, guiding them, guarding them, leading them, you're with us now, here, as we worship. So we praise you, great and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet, when we come into your presence, we're immediately aware of the fact we aren't worthy to be here. What poor disciples of Jesus we are. <coughs> How badly our lives reflect his love. How slow we are to follow in his steps. Jesus forgave his enemies. But we tend to be vindictive and seek revenge. Jesus never used force to, to achieve his objectives. But we want our own way. Whatever the means of attaining it. Father, forgive us. Give us a true desire to fight against all that's wrong in the world. Show us that the only effective weapons in the struggle are those which Jesus used. So may we witness for him by our behaviour, our grasp of truth, our patience and kindliness, by the gifts of the Holy Spirit and by sincere love declaring the truth by the power of God. So we know that when we truly repent, choosing to turn and go in entirely the opposite direction from which our worldly lives want us to go, we know that you are always ready to forgive us. And we thank you that we can know that we are once more washed clean in the oceans of your forgiving love. So, Almighty Father, we thank you that you've revealed your power and glory through your mighty acts of creation and revealed your redeeming and transforming love through your Son. Thank you that you've called us to your service and that those whom you call, you equip for the tasks ahead. Thank you for the realisation that though by ourselves we can do nothing, we can do all things in Christ who strengthens us. So, Almighty, loving God, we rededicate our lives to you. Give us, we pray, humility to acknowledge our needs and your help, faith to trust in your powerful love, and courage to fight against all that's wrong within us and around us. To your glory, and we ask these prayers in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> and now, you're going to have a children's address. <laughs> <laughs> <Or> not. <laughs>
Well, we didn't know who would be here this morning, so uh, uh, yes, could, could I sort out and do a children's address? So I said to Richard, shall, shall I continue? So, yeah. Um, so imagine I'm talking to those there, and I would include you anyway in it. So, um, has anybody had a birthday recently? Last month? Anybody? Yeah, one or two. One or two. Has anybody got a birthday coming next month? Oh, sorry, the month we're in, in August. Right. Oh, lots of hands up. Okay. Right. Um, anybody having a birthday in the next next coming week? Right. Oh gosh. Right. So I might just point to you. Um, right, Jill. Are you expecting some presents? Maybe, yeah. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. maybe. <laughs> um, so, do you know um, about any of the presents that you might be getting or not? Um, yes, yeah, yes, because I've been told to save a date. Oh, right, okay. So you had a bit of a hint. Okay, who, who else's hands were up for having a birthday in the, in the coming week? Whoa. <laughs> I'll go this way, Colleen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, right. Uh, any idea? Are you going to have any presents for your um, birthday? I don't mind. You don't <laughs> know. If somebody wants to buy me something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you don't know whether you don't know whether you are having a present or not. No. But and I was going to say to the children, you know, if uh, you know, do they know if they're having a present? And oh. Yeah, yes, they're, they're, they're pretty sure they're, they're going to have a present, so, because that's what happens at birthdays. Um, can I be cheeky, Jill, and ask who has um, asked you to reserve a date? Uh, uh, David, my... David, David, yeah. David has. All oh, right, good. So you know the present is, yes. coming from, is coming from David. I do know a present that I would have got had the dog not got it first. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave, I'll leave that one. Yeah. You wish you'd never asked him. <laughs> <laughs> and and David, so you should buy your presents. Yes, yes. 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 Yeah. So, and Colleen, do you know who? Do you know? Um, you, you say you're, you're not worried. So, <laughs> no, I think that might be taken out for lunch or something. Yes. Like that. And who, might I ask who who is that by? Little. Me, son. So you normally get a present from from son. <laughs> and if you think about all of us. We normally get a present from somebody in the family for our birthdays, don't we? Um, but we don't, um, for the children, usually, the presents they will immediately think of are presents from their parents. They don't, we don't know if the presents are coming, but we do hope and we believe those presents will because we trust that we will have a present. And faith is a bit like that. Trust, I think, the, the difference to me is that trust is you can see the people, yes? Mm -hmm. Faith, it's a trust, but you can't see the people <coughs> involved. And faith is what we have <coughs> in God. We can't physically see him, but we trust that he will give us presence of whatever sort. And to help the kids remember faith, I worked out F-A-I-T-H. F is the easy one. F is for? Father. Yeah? A. Any ideas? Always. Always. Oh, I haven't thought of that one. I don't with amazing. Okay. I. I gave you a bit of a hint, the difference between trust and faith. God is, somebody said it. Invisible. Invisible. Thanks, Tricia. And the TH is for thank you. <coughs> so, if you see the word faith, just think about those things. <coughs> hear more about 
faith enriches service. Of course, you're far more likely to remember what has just been said. <laughs> Children's addresses are like that, aren't they? Much more easy to grasp. So we'll sing our next hymn together, number 51, if you're following it in the hymn book. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Number 51. Continuing to 16. 
At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand in the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that he was splitting mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. <coughs> and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall appoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall appoint Jehu, son of Nebshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphtah of Abdelmakak, as prophet in your place. Amen. taken from Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 to 23. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came he was there alone but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And then they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and he said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of a little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. sing our next hymn. When how long it is since you last sang this one? <laughs> the golden old year that there was one. We're going to sing Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm doth bind the restless wave, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril of the sea. Number 517.
you this story before, but it's very relevant. <coughs> at the place that I used to work at some years ago, I'd just finally been promoted to my lowest level of incompetence <laughs> when the company started to wind down and get rid of its workforce, one-fifth being wiped out every six months. And so, a year or so later, it became my turn and I was made redundant. <coughs> six months went past in which I spent all my time worrying and struggling and trying to find a job without any success whatsoever. And I prayed about it, of course I did. Come on, Lord, help. I'm not completely stupid. Surely you can find something for me to do, something so that I can support my family. And it was then that friends suggested to me why don't you set up your own business and do something that you are good at? And I did. And it worked. And from then on, I found real happiness and contentment. I used to wake up and say, oh good, it's Monday morning. How many of us can say that? Success, failure, and success again through faith. That's part of the story that we heard read about Elijah, isn't it? He'd been so successful getting rid of the prophets of Baal, proving who God really was in front of the people. And they wiped them, the prophets of Baal out. But then Jezebel, Ahab, the king's wife, said, because she was a supporter of Baal, I'm going to do the same to you by the way tomorrow. And so he fled and ran into the wilderness and hid in a cave. And there God said to him, What on earth are you doing here? Elijah and showed him that power wasn't really important in the world that he, God, was and with that renewed faith and understanding Elijah then went on and out and anointed two more people kings and continued prophesying and preaching to the people until long after Ahab and Jezebel were dead. So, here we are. And Jesus said, Take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. And through faith, we see God's providential care transforming human perspectives and prospects. In that gospel lesson which we heard, we can see that nothing stands alone. Maybe over the last week or two, you've had the stories that preceded it of John the Baptist being beheaded and Jesus trying to go away from that area where John was to try and find somewhere a bit safer and somewhere where he could have some peace and get a time of contemplation and prayer. But God doesn't let him get away. As he goes across the lake to a quiet place, the people see where he's going and follow him round the edge and they get there before him. And he's confronted with this massive crowd. <coughs> all 
getting his teaching, all needing his healing and care. And he spends a whole day doing just that. And at the end of the evening, the people are still there, and he has to push his disciples into understanding a little bit more, challenging them to feed the people. And they don't know how to or where to begin. And so he, through faith, feeds the 5,000. And then he dismisses, he sends his disciples off ahead, <clears throat> further across the lake, while he dismisses the people and goes off further up into the hill for time alone with his father. And there, once more, recognizes his raison d'etre and is once more centered on what he's there to do. And the hectic day which his Heavenly Father had provided had carried him beyond his own previous personal needs, redirecting his aim to the principle of his mission. And Matthew, in the Gospel that we had read, puts these two scenes alongside one another. The laboring disciples, unable to make any headway against the storm which surrounds them, and into which they're totally committed, and to Jesus, with his quiet communion with his Father on the hillside, and from this prayer and thought time, centered with his Father to go on in his father's strength and assurance to fulfill his mission. So there they are, these disciples, so wrapped up in their own problem, they can see no further than what they're presently engaged in, battling against the wind and the waves. And they're failing, failing to achieve their objective as they've lost sight of it. And it happened on other occasions too. It happened when they were trying to heal uh, an epileptic whilst Jesus was up on the Mount of Transfiguration. To say nothing of when they fled from the Garden of Gethsemane on the night in which he was arrested. So there they are battling against the wind and waves, getting nowhere, totally committed to their present task rather than looking towards the ultimate objective. And that's the situation as far as they're concerned. We were on holiday in Italy, one of the Italian lakes. And one morning, we decided after breakfast, we would like to go across the lake to another place and so we shot out of the hotel, down to the lakeside, and caught this express boat that took us over to this other place on the other side, where they've got this magnificent mountain in the background, and you, we queued up to catch this <laughs> incredible revolving lift. I've told you this before. It revolved horizontally, not vertically. And we were taken up to the top of the mountain, and there we got out. And it was at that point, as the people in the lift with us got their cagoules and their fleeces out of their rucksacks, <laughs> and I stood there in my t-shirt and shorts, <laughs> gazing round at the amazing view and smiling and trying not to let my teeth chatter too visibly, <laughs> to realise that I hadn't really prepared properly for what I was going to be doing. Are you the same? Or are you much more sensible and better prepared than I am? Sometimes though, when we're suddenly confronted with a problem and with the best of intentions, we can throw
throw ourselves into sorting it out, can't we? And the trouble is, we find ourselves concentrating on the immediate <coughs> problem rather than looking at the solution. A friend of mine used to refer to a colleague of ours as the fire bucket man. <laughs> what he meant was this guy would go round with water and chuck some water onto a fire and dampen it down and then rush on to the next one and chuck some water on and, and so on and so on never actually putting any of them out. And by the time he'd finished, the original one was blazing again. What we read about Jesus tells us that he always tried to spend some time with his Heavenly Father, which helped to readjust his thinking, to see the bigger picture. And it's important then to give time and thought and prayer to what our Lord is guiding us to. So that he can use us successfully and our faith will grow as a consequence. So Jesus went out to his struggling disciples walking on the water and they weren't expecting him. And they were terrified. Wouldn't you be? Wouldn't I be? But he called to them to reassure them. His loving concern to put them at their ease, even before he reached them, stopping their fear. Then, in amazement, Peter responds, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come. He wants further confirmation, as they all do. He isn't asking for supernatural powers for himself. Rather, he wants to know that it is Jesus, because he knows that when Jesus commands, things happen. And unless he commands, nothing unusual is going to occur. So when Jesus calls, Peter gets out of the boat and walks towards him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a famous theologian killed by Hitler in 1945, just before Germany fell, wrote about this incident. He said Peter had to leave the boat and risk his life on the sea in order to learn both his own weakness and the almighty power of his Lord. The road to faith passes through obedience to the call of Jesus. And if people imagine that they can follow Jesus without taking this step, they're deluding themselves. What Bonhoeffer didn't write, and perhaps it's obvious, Peter was prepared to take the risk to prove who Jesus was. But Bonhoeffer did go on to draw the conclusion, faith is only real where there's obedience, never without it. And faith only becomes faith in the act of obedience. So his thoughts either confirm or help us to understand what we read in the letter of James, and in chapter 2, James wrote, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith, but has no deeds? Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you mine by what I do. So Peter climbed out of the boat. The trouble was that having stepped out and started on the journey, he took his eyes off Jesus and looked at the surroundings, the wind and the waves. He looked at the problem and panicked. And are we like that too? Starting out well-intentioned, but then losing the proper perspective? Isn't it easy? 
don't think this is just another story of the skeptic who habitually doubts. Rather, as one of my reference books suggests, it's a story of faithful followers who begin to lose their nerve when they discover the odds stacked against them, and who find a steadying hand, a delivering hand from Jesus. And that's the ultimate point, isn't it? We can trust him to save, and he does. One of our more modern hymns states, in the discipline of praying, when it's hardest to believe, in the drudgery of caring, when it's not enough to grieve, faith, maturing, learns acceptance of the insights we receive. Peter can be seen as a typical example <coughs> of a disciple. In him, disciples ancient and modern can see themselves and take heart, finding courage to do what they would otherwise fail to even start in response to Jesus' call, and discovering, like Peter, that Jesus always graciously moves to secure our faltering faith. The life of all God's people and those around them are permeated with his hidden but decisive purposes. These purposes can be discovered in your life and mine through the eyes of faith. So remember the old hymn and fix your eyes upon Jesus. going to sing again. Our next hymn is number 666, if you're following it in the hymn book. Master, speak again, thy servant heareth, waiting for thy gracious word. Number 666.
offer our gifts to you. We pray that you'll accept them and use them in such a way that even we are amazed at what you, what you can achieve with what we offer. So take these gifts and all the efforts of our hearts and minds, our skills and abilities, every effort that we may take a worthy share in the work of your kingdom. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Amen. And now let us pray. Prayers of intercession. Dear God, you are our Father. A Father offers protection and guidance to his children. Guide the leaders of countries who are at war. And today we especially think of Russia and Ukraine. But there are many other areas which no longer make media headlines. Guide their leaders and those who mediate between warring factions that the destruction of lives and countries' infrastructures will cease. That the hatred, pride and selfishness that generates the conflicts will be changed so that countries can live in peace together. Guide our countries and our local politicians so our country too can live in peace. Dear God, you are amazing. You created a world beyond our imagination where plants, creatures and humans can think of and do things we never thought possible. Medical science makes incredible strides, but it needs funding to reach everyone. Let us spend some moments remembering all those who we know personally, who need healing, and pray too for those seeking and funding all those who work in social care and all the medical professions. Amazing God, you've given people insight into how we are wrecking your beloved creation as we experience climate change. We think of the problems affecting the World Scout Jamboree in South Korea and those dealing with the aftermath of the wildfires in Greece and Canada. Open our minds and hearts to accept the changes we can make to our lifestyles so that all your world can live safely. Dear God, you are invisible, but we have faith in you. <coughs> we are all invisible to most of the world's population, but they see us as we see you through the help we are able to give. Our donations and physical support for so many charities, both here and abroad. Medical aid, for old people, for children and youngsters, for the homeless, for food banks, for supporting refugees, for protecting wildlife and habitats, for we all know so many more. This love and concern being shown is showing you to the world. Let us renew our commitment to supporting all that is being done to make your world a more loving place. Thank you, God, for all you have done. 
are doing and will continue to do for your creation. Give us the hearts, the minds and the strength so that your will will be done. Amen. So we'll continue in prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Oh. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. Kingdom, power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> so we sing our last hymn together, number 661 in our hymn books. Give me the faith which can remove and sink the mountain to a plain. Give me the childlike praying love which longs to build thy house again. Thy love. Let in my heart all power and all my simple soul devour. Number 661.
Amen. Amen.